All right, yeah, we'll solve the fourth question from the exam. So the fourth question is about the FSMs, the finite state machines. So in this question, you are basically given a, a state representation of, of SF, FSM. And the question asks like several questions related to the FSM, for example, the uh, representing it in a Boolean equation in, in, in one hat encoding, binary encoding, and output encoding, and as well as like what's wrong with this representation, and we're going to try to correct it. So, you can see it right, okay. So, um, for the first, so for the question, we have states, and for the states, we also have the output, and these are the TAs and TBs are inputs. So, the question asks, so there's a critical component missing in the FSM, and what is this missing component? So if you look closely to that FSM, you'll see that there is no reset line, right? So we need to have that in order to have a, a, a basically have a deterministic behavior in that FSM. So we'll say that we don't have the reset, reset line for this FSM. So for the second question, it says of the two FSM types, which are Moore's and Mealy's, uh, what type of an FSM is this? Basically, if you look at that representation, you'll see that the output it only depends on the only depends on the state, but doesn't depend on the input, right? So this means that this is a Moore's representation. So if the output only depends on the state, then this means that this is Moore's. So all right, so far so good, I guess. These are the relatively the easier ones. Uh, all right. So for the for the C, it says that lists one major advantage of each type of state encoding below. For one hot encoding, our aim is to reduce the next logic uh, uh, wires, right? So for the for the one hot, we we basically try to uh, represent each next state logic hopefully ideal a bit, single bit. So this means that you reduce, so you reduce next state logic. With the one hot encoding. So for the binary encoding, our aim is to use the least amount of bits to represent the states. For for the fourth one, uh, for this one, mm -hmm. so uh, so I'm I'm actually not sure about this, but like uh, so does does it say the same thing in the slides as well, or or? So should we comply with that, Juan? If the book says this is optional uh, to have the reset line, uh, do you think like this is a missing component as well, like a critical component? So if the book says this is optional, I will say yeah, then okay. I think for that one, yeah, we can comply with the book, but Girai has a point, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah. Yes, with the reset line we basically define the initial state. Yeah. Okay, so the reset line implies initial state. Yes, this is true. Uh, I, I will top so actually. So you need to, you need, so for the representation, yeah, you can say that, yeah, this is our uh, initial state, but to really have it as an initial state, then you should make sure that uh, when, you, when you start this FSM, it's really gonna be the initial state, right? So how do you ensure that? You need to have some sort of reset line so that it goes there when you reset and then you start it as an initial state for that. Basically, it means 
the same thing to have the initial state and the reset line. Okay. Any questions related to those? Okay. Uh, so for the binary encoding, yeah, as I said, we, we try to basically use the least amount of bits to represent the state. So this means that you reduce the flip-flops that you need to represent the states. So this is, I would say, the major advantage of binary encoding. Reduce flip-flops. Um, and for the output encoding, our goal is to basically uh, use the least amount of logic units for, for, to encode the output, right? So this is also clear. I guess if there is no question with those. Okay. So starting from the, the question, uh, uh, ask us like, so okay, we are given those states, and like, uh, so how should we uh, write the basically the Boolean equation of that of that state? And we have, and we have three options. One option is one hand, one hat encoding, and second option binary, as you can see here. And then the third option is output encoding. So for all of those, the, what changes is basically the way that we represent the states, and the rest won't change, right? So, and basically, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to write a truth table, kind of like a higher level truth table, I would say, because I'm not going to represent the states with the, with the bits. Uh, and this will be my kind of like a reference for the next three questions. So, um, for that truth table, I have current state, let's say. I have my TA, TB, uh, the output is two bits, so O1, O0, and the next state, right? So for the current state, starting from the A, let's say, uh, so if I have, um, so the TA basically don't care, so if I have TB1, I'll go to, I'll visit C, for again being in state C, uh, A, T, A, don't care. And if I have T, B, not, um, I'm sorry, yeah, that's, so if I have uh, zero here, so I'll visit B. So if I have one here, I'll visit C. And the output when I'm in, uh, in state A will be one, zero, one, zero. So for the state B, so if I have um, zero for TA, for TA, then I'll visit C, then this means that zero and don't care for TB, uh, C, right, yeah, C. Um, so for again B, if I have TA1, don't care for TB, then I'll visit A, and the output will be one one. For C, so no matter what, I'll visit D. Then these T A's and T B's are don't cares, and the output will be the zero one, and the next state will be D. For D, so if I have zero for T B and don't care for T A, then this means that I'll visit B, and if I have uh, one for when, when I'm in D, then this means that I'll visit D again, and the output will be zero, zero, and zero, zero. So let me see if everything looks good here. Uh, TB zero, I guess, yeah, will go to B, and TB one will go to C, right? Okay. So. The, this tour table is basically like a kind of like a higher level tour table here. I would say because I don't have the bits for the current state and the next state, but I have the explicit bits for the output and, and the input bits basically. So for the following three questions, basically what I'm going to change, 
are only the current state, the, the way that I represent the current state and also the way I represent the next state, but those will not change, right? So these are basically independent from the, from the uh, encoding that I'm using. So I'm gonna use this as a reference for the following questions. So I already written this, basically, if you wonder, uh, to save you some time. Uh, for the one encoding, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to try to represent each state using a single bit. Then this means that I'm, I'm going to write it like that. So for example, I can represent A with the uh, least, significant, least significant bit, and B as follows, C and D. All right, so here then this means that every state is represented by a single bit. So I'm gonna put that into the table that I've written here. Uh, so I'm gonna represent the current state as C3, C2, C1, C0, and the next states as N3, uh, N2, N1, N0. And basically, so if you remember, so those are, those two rows are AA, so I'm going to write the way that I represent A here, and which is this. And the next state was B, and I present B as follows. And again, A, because I have A here. And the next state for, the, for this one will be C. And yeah, I think you kind of got the rest. So this will be B, and the next state will be C, and the way I represent C like this. And again B, and uh, the output will be A. So this means that this. So I have C, and output the next will be D, and for D, I have first B here, and again, I have D here. All right, so this is a true table for, for D. Yeah. Which one, I'm sorry? Let me see. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. So this this will be zero, right? Yeah. yeah. And this will be one, I guess. Yes, that's true. When TB is zero, yeah, I go to V, and then T, when TB is one, I go to C. Yeah, that's true, that's correct. Okay, so based on that, basically I'll write the, uh, the, the, the next states and also the outputs, I guess, right? Yeah. C and V, okay. Uh, all right, so let's write N3 here. So I'll check like when N3 is one, N3 is one when for, the, for these two uh, rows. And for the one hot encoding, basically this means that we, should, we ensure that if one, uh, one of the bits in the input is one, then this means that the rest should be zero. So we can regard them as don't cares. So when the, when the entry is uh, one, this means that C2 is one and uh, and that's it, I guess. So let me do some sanity check here. Yeah. All right, so, and the second one is this. When N3 is one and C3, uh, and also TB, I guess. All right, okay. So for, for N2, I have two rows as follows. 
So when n2 is 1, here I have c0, 1, and also tb as 1. Right? Yeah, that's, that's correct. And again, for n, n2 is 1, c1 is 1, and also ta is 0. So ta not. Let me check it again. Yeah, ca. Okay. So uh, for for n one, so I have here n one one. So this means that c zero is one, and uh, so I have tb as zero. Okay. And for that one, I have C3 uh, as one, and also, uh, and also we have TB0. All right. So this should be simplified as, if I'm correct, yeah, TB, C0, or C3, right? Okay. Yeah, for the next N0, I have, I have one here, and that's it, I guess. Yeah, so this means that C11 and also TA1, right? Yes, okay. So these are the next state logic, uh, the equations for the next states. And for the output, for output one, I have one when uh, basically, so I have the output one when basically either C0 is one and it doesn't, it also doesn't depend on the TA or TB or when C1 is one, right? Can you see that? The rest, so uh, O1 is one when Either C0 is 1 or C1 is 1, right? And for the Z C0 rows, then I have the TA already, they don't care, and TB also doesn't change the result. And it's the same as well for the, uh, for the TA. So I, I only have C0 and C1. For O0, O0 I have uh, once here. So I have C1, 1. And it also doesn't depend on the TA, or I have C2, C, C2, 1, and I guess that's, yeah, that also doesn't depend on the input, yeah. So these are my, the, uh, the Boolean equation for output. Okay. All right, so the, we will move on to the other one. So for the binary, so basically we can use two bits for, to represent four, four states, right? So basically I'm gonna represent A then as zero, zero, but it's all up to you how you represent. It doesn't really matter. But like make sure that you use like minimum amount of bits to present states. So the same thing that I've done like in the, in the previous question. So, but this time we have only two bits, then this means that I'll write it as follows. So zero, zero, and let me follow that one. Um, sorry, yeah, let me follow that one again. Zero, zero, I have zero, one, zero, zero, I have one, zero, zero, one, I have again one, zero, Zero one, I have zero zero. Uh, for one zero, I have one one. For one one, I have zero one. And again, for one one, I have one one. So this will be the true table for uh, to represent states in in a binary encoding. And um, so yeah, let's write the um, let's write the next. Uh, state logic unit for N0. I'm going to write it here. Uh, for N0, I have one here, four here. 
So this means that C1 not, C0 not, and TB is one, okay? Or I have ones here, so notice that I, I always have C1 as one, and when C0 is zero, I also, like, I don't also depend on the TA, TB, or when C0, one, so it also doesn't depend on the neither uh, either TA or TB. Okay, I guess that's the that's the answer for that one. Let me check. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and let's see. Yeah, then yeah, we can also simplify that, right? So this is always one. Uh, for N1, uh, I'll check the rows. I have one here. So this means that for this one, I have C1 not and C0 not, TB not, um, C0 not, TB not, or C0 uh, TA. Okay, and for these ones, or I have C1 as one, and C0 not, or here uh, C0 and TB, I guess. So this should, uh, yeah, this is as is. Yeah, this is not simplified. For O1, so I have ones here, so this means that C1 is always zero. Uh, for that one, if I have C0 not, this also doesn't depend on the, uh, yeah. I guess only C1 here, yeah, only C1, but that's right. C0 not or C0. And for for O0, uh, so I have ones here again. And um, C1 will be, uh, C1 will be zero for two rows. And also, C0 will be, let me write it in this way. And yeah, I have, I actually have C0 not and C1 here, or uh, C1, C0 not, right? So you can ignore that part. So this is basically XOR, right? So you can write it as, C0, XOR, C1 as well. All right, yeah. The question is a bit uh, long, let's say, to write. Uh, but do you have any questions so far? How I wrote, how I write these two tables? Yeah. And so if I don't simplify it, like if I don't write XOR, is it really Yeah, so it's, so it's going to, so it matters for the for the last question because it's it's going to restrict you uh, saying that you only have and then I guess or gates right. So this means that you cannot use the XOR. Basically, you'll need to use the and then or gates. But in this question, I guess yeah you can um, yeah you can leave it as is because using minimum possible number of bits to represent the state. So. Yeah, I guess we can leave it as is in in that manner. Yes, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but make sure that you also simplify it as much as as possible. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So for the last one, uh, that will be also yeah, that's tricky because it asks for the output encoding. Then this means that I need to make sure that the output is uh, encoding encoded. 
so that the output logic uh, circuitry will be basically minimized, right? So how can I ensure beforehand without writing the without writing the truth table and the circuitry? So I'll show you basically how I did it in this question. So I have two bit output rights, outputs, and the inputs for the states I can uh, use, uh, let's say, two bits at least, at least. So what I want to ensure is basically, I want to ensure that when O1 is one, <coughs> When O1 is 1, then O1 is determined exactly, hopefully, uh, by 1 bit. Okay? So let's say that I'll use uh, 2 bits for the, for the states, then this means that C1 and C0. So let's ensure that, for example, the output 1 is only determined by C1. Okay? And the output 0 is only determined by by C0. So how can I then write the encoding uh, in a correct manner so that I'll make sure that the output one only determined by C1 and the output zero only determined by the C0. So you can write it as follows. So for C1, so what I want to do is basically I want to have the same bit right when O1 is 1, then the, the first four rows. Then I don't want to have the same bit, which is k, for the remaining rows when the O1 is 0. So this means that I will have m's here. So I'm not writing 1 or 0, but I'm writing k and m's. For the C0, and I want to make sure that the, uh, the, these three rows uh, are determined by, the, by, the, uh, by a single bit, by a unique bit, then this means that let's use y here for this tree, and for the rest I, that I don't want to use the same thing. So this means that I will have z, uh, z's. So here what it says that k is not equal to m, and, and uh, y is, uh, it does not equal to the uh, z, right? So, but what you can see here as well, so, uh, so, so basically, if you give k, for example, 1, then this means that m will be 0, right? And in that case, so let me also put that up into, yeah, when, so for example, when, this, when you give z1, z 0, then this means that y will be 1. Okay, so you can, you can play with it as, as you want. But so when you use, for example, these bits here, then you'll have your representation for A, B, C, D. Right? So you can play with those. You can, you can select K, 0, and then the rest will be assured accordingly, basically. Did you get that idea or? OK. Uh, all right, then let's present A as then this means that A is 1, 0, B, B means K1 and uh, Y1, C means, um, so I have M here, 0, right, 0, 1, and D here, I have M, 0, 0, okay? So let's write, then, okay, let's write in that sense. So I have I have A here, then C1, C0, N1, N0. Um, this is 1, 0. This goes to B. Then this means that this is 1, 1. I have this goes to C. This means that 0, 1. Uh, uh, 1, 1. This goes to C again. C is 0, 1. B is 1, 1 again, and it goes to A, which is 1, 0. I have C here, 0, 1, and this goes to D, which is 0, 0. Uh, and for D, 
goes to B, which is 1, 1, and again for D, that goes to D, 0, 0, all right? So, yeah, that's a bit long, so if you allow me to save some time, I'm going to directly write the, the Boolean equation, because what you do is basically I'm going to, again, check the one, the rows that are one here and the rows that are one for N0, and then I'm just going to write uh, as is. So this this will be C1, C0 naught, and TB naught, C1, C0, TA, I guess, and C1 naught, C, um, uh, C0 naught, and TB, and this will be simplified as C0, TB not, or C1, C0, TA, and 4, and 0, I'll, I will have C1, uh, C0 not here, or C0, TA not, or C1, C0 naught and TB naught. And for O1, I already ensured that this is determined by C1 and O0. This is determined by C0. Okay. So this is the F1. The last question asks, uh, right? So the, the last question says that, uh, so which one would you choose to minimize the total area of this FSM? So if you count the number of logics, in the Boolean equation that I write, so you'll, you'll see that we have 10 logic units for one, uh, one hot encoding, and I have two bits to represent the Philip, uh, to represent the states. And for binary, I have 11 plus XOR, this would make 14 and uh, two flip flops. And for output encoding, I have again 10 uh, uh, logic units and two flip flops. So in, the, in that manner, so using output encoding makes sense over the others. Is there any question? All right. I guess we can move to the next. Uh, yeah, this question has two parts. Um, in the first part, uh, it's warm up, computing a Fibonacci number. So the, this uh, is about uh, writing uh, MIPS code uh, to compute the Fibonacci number. And as you know, this is the expression for uh, uh, the, the calculating Fibonacci number. And here you have a, a high level language code, C code, uh, to calculate this uh, Fibonacci number. So as you can see, we have three variables. We have A originally uh, is equal zero, B is equal one, and this is C, that is A equal, is, uh, equal uh, A plus B. And then we get into this while loop that will be repeated uh, like uh, n minus one times. And in, and in the loop body, what we have is uh, we first compute A plus B and store the result in C. And then we uh, um, store B in A and C in B. So uh, finally, we decrement this counter n and we repeat the loop while n is greater than one. So here there are some um, assumptions, conventions um, to, to write all code. Uh, but let's say that the most important thing for now is that the argument n, that is this counter here, is going to be stored in register four, and the result c is C here is going to be stored in register two. Then there are also some uh, register numbers, for, uh, for example, for Kali say temporary registers, we're going to need these because uh, as you will see um, uh, in the code, uh, the, this uh, Fibonacci uh, computation is going to be in one function. Then we have the stack pointer. We are going to need the stack pointer, as you might remember, to save uh, the uh, temporary registers. 
And we also need one return address because, uh, as you remember, every time that we call a subroutine, we call a function, we need to start the return address somewhere. And the return address is the return program counter. And this is typically stored in register 31. So let's take a look at this code. Um, yeah, let me do something so that you can see the code. So the very first thing that you uh, you find in this uh, function, in this Fibonacci function, is that, well, this is the beginning of the function, and the very first thing is uh, storing the registers into the stack, because some of these registers might have some uh, values that are used for the main are, are useful for the main function, uh, but these registers might be needed by the function itself. You know that the number of registers in every computer, but especially in the MIPS computer that we have uh, studied here in this course, it's uh, quite limited. So it might uh, be necessary to uh, to use uh, some of these registers that are already being used by the main function, the, fun the color function. So that's why the first thing that we have to do is uh, saving the registers, in this case, registers 16, 17, and 18. Uh, 17 and 18. We store them in some part of the memory that is pointed by the stack pointer. And uh, right after that, we initialize the registers with some values because we are going to use them. Okay, you had one question? Excuse me, you had one question? Um, yeah, well, I have just one simple question. I'm sure that it's not, uh, it's not relevant to what we right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> then we, you can ask maybe later in the break. Yeah. Okay. So uh, observe that, well, let's say that this is the uh, function call. Um, so it's, this is the beginning of the function. Right uh, after uh, starting with the function, we have to store some uh, temporary values in this uh, stack. And right after that, the first thing that we do is this first uh, C equal A plus B. So this is an addition we store C in register two, in register six, uh, 17, and 18, we have A and B. So this corresponds to this first C equal uh, A plus B. And now the next thing that we are going to find is this while loop, right? So in the while loop, the first thing we do is checking the boundary condition. So here, this is N must be greater than n, than one to get into the loop body. And this is what we are doing with this set on less than immediate. Um, we compare uh, this register 16 that contains n, we compare it to two and uh, if register 16 is less than 2, then register 3 will be equal 1, right? Observe that um, if it's uh, equal 1, it won't branch, right? So it will go, so sorry, if this is equal one, it's not equal to zero. So if it's not equal to zero, won't take this, this branch, so it will go to the loop body. And what do we have in the loop body? Well, the first thing that we have is, again, add to uh, 17, 18, that is C equal A plus B, corresponding to this instruction here. Uh, then we uh, store B 
in A. So that's why what, what here we are essentially doing is adding B plus zero and storing it in A in, reg in register uh, 17. We do the same to store C in B and after that we decrement minus one. This is uh, immediate addition minus one to decrement N. Right after that we have this unconditional branch, this jump instruction to start again and evaluate uh, again the value uh, of the content of uh, uh, register 16 that contains N. So we repeat this as many times as needed. Uh, when um, uh, when 16 uh, is uh, 16 con contains N. Uh, when 16 is uh, lower than two, then this will be zero, and then here we will take the branch and we will uh, until this uh, down here, and we will finish the loop. And the very last part that you can find here in the um, in the code is this restore because uh, remember that in the beginning what we did was storing the content of these temporary registers in the stack. Now, right before leaving the function, we have to restore the contents of the registers. Yeah. Do you have any questions here? Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. So in the in the exam, what I recommend you to use is to to do the notation that um, the, the the question itself is it's using, right? So in this case, um, we are using uh, the numbers. In other case, you will use the error something. But as you know, and actually you can check in the in the slides. They they are uh, they they have the similar the, the same meaning, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Are we saving the return address inside the stack just as a formality, or otherwise it, is it done because it's not overwritten? Yeah, exactly. It's not it's not overwritten. This is just a convention. In, in so you can save it in case uh, in case you might need to use this. But this is just a convention. But it would not be wrong. It would not be wrong if you don't overwrite it. Okay? Actually, my question before was about the name of the registers. But uh, the way we're using it basically is the convention. Can you anywhere in the graph be used? Well, I mean, usually if you have in the final exam some question, similar question like this, we will probably give you this kind of convention. If we don't give it to you, you are not required to know exactly this, but you can check uh, in the slides and you will see what are the typical registers that are used for some uh, particular purpose. Mm -hmm. Okay? But uh, if there are these uh, preserved uh, as the code registers and the ones that are not preserved, um, so basically, um, it could, it's just a convention in this right? It's just a convention, exactly. I mean, if uh, one question like this asks you to stick with some convention, you should uh, stick. It's not more than that. So they are they are uh, they are Kali safe because they are saved by the Kali, right? This doesn't mean that the caller cannot use them. Uh, the, before calling the function, before calling this Fibonacci function, we have some other function, maybe a main function that calls the Fibonacci function, and this main function might be using these registers. 
uh, if we have uh, this convention and every time that the function is called, we store uh, these uh, registers in the stack, we are on the safe side, right? Yes, exactly. It might, I mean, this, keep in mind also that you write this Fibonacci function just once, right? And then you might need to call it from different place in your main program or in different programs. And sometimes you might be using these registers, sometimes not, okay? I mean, it's, uh, your question is related to his question. Um, in some particular situation, you might be able to do that, but uh, the thing is that you are going to write this function just once. You just want to write this function once. And you know that in this function, there are three registers that are used, that are 16, 17, and 18, and you're going to operate using them. Um, it might happen that sometimes you're really using these registers, uh, other times uh, not. But it is safe to have this convention that those registers that are going to be used by the function are by uh, default safe in the stack. And this way you avoid any possible uh, overwritten. Say again? Because we could just use uh, as for convention stated in the exercise to produce it and there is no change Yeah, sure. But uh, how do you know that these uh, have not been uh, are not in use by should be for sure, but by the convention they should be colors safe, but because we don't know for sure we just do it. Yeah. Okay. You had another question? Uh -huh. We have to like know the mob really well, or is it like more focused on this? Well, I think that you should know really well what Professor Mudlu has explained in the lectures, and what you, and ideally also what you have in the optional homework. Yeah, it's a, a reasonable answer. We mainly see exercises which they always talk about MIPS. We we see MIPS the whole time. There are also many, uh, several lectures where uh, we have talked about LC3B and also there are a few uh, exercises in the, in the homework. Yeah, in, in this uh, homework uh, three, for example, there are at least three or four. Sure. So what do you mean is that about Actually, you can use this one. Yeah, so basically, um, when we provide the instruction definition, we also provide the semantics. So we tell uh, this is uh, this uh, register, this nature register, and those two are resource registers. And basically, the exam should know exactly what instruction is doing what. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's on if you want to switch it off. Okay. Uh, shall we continue, or do you have any other questions? Okay, uh, let's go to part two. And uh, here, uh, MIPS assembly for rep mob SV. So uh, here, uh, we are asked to uh, write some code 
some MIPS code that is going to do essentially what one x86 instruction does. And this is a x86 instruction is this rep mob SV. The mob SV part means that we are moving bytes and the rep part means that this is going to be repeated several times. This uh, instruction has three registers. Um, there is uh, one count register, this uh, ECX, and then we have one source register and one destination registers, register. This source and destination are two pointers to two different arrays, and uh, what this operation does is for several times, and this number of times is uh, the content of this register ECX, uh, what we do is copying byte by byte from the source array to the destination array. And after uh, each of these copies, uh, these two, uh, ESI and EDI, are uh, incremented. So part A in this question, uh, sorry, what's wrong here? Okay, part A in this question is asking about how to implement this in MIPS. So, uh, yeah, this, this actually has some similarities with the uh, first part. Uh, in summary, what we are going to have here is if, if we, let's say, we, we write the high-level language code for this instruction, we would have something like this, right? E, C, X. Um, uh, greater than zero because ECX is the counter, right, where we have the total number of bytes that we need to uh, copy. And uh, this would be something like EDI uh, ECX equal E, sorry, ESI ECX. This ECX would be like our <coughs> counter and also index to these arrays uh, ESI and EDI, and after uh, every iteration, we decrement. So this would be like the, let's say, the high-level language code to implement this rep mob. And, um, uh, and, and here what we have is the uh, MIPS code. There are, uh, we assume that uh, ECX is uh, stored in register one, ESI is in register two, and EDI is in register three. The first thing that we do is checking what's the value of register one, that is the value of our counter, and if it's not zero, we will go to the loop. And in this loop, as you can see, we load one byte, we store this byte in the corresponding memory position. These memory positions are determined by register two, that, that is ESI, so the pointer to the source array, and this one, register three, is the pointer to the destination array. So right after that, we increment register two and register three to point to the next byte, and we decrement uh, register one that contains ECX, so it contains our counter. And after that, uh, we check, uh, so we check what's the uh, value of a register one, if it's uh, still greater than zero. If it's greater than zero, we jump, we branch to the beginning of the loop body. If it's not, then we go to the rest of the code, to the following instructions. So this is very similar to what we did before. And I think it's uh, quite easy to understand. So I don't know if you have any questions. So let's continue and go to, the, to part B in this second part of the exercise. It says, what is the size of the MIPS assembly code you wrote in A in bytes? How does it compare to uh, rep mob SV? And it says, note, rep mob SV occupies two bytes, right? So this uh, Intel X86 uh, instruction occupies two bytes. And the question is, how many bytes occupies in memory this code that we have just uh, written? Well, as you know, in MIPS, every, um, 
instruction is stored in four bytes. And if you count the total number of instructions, this is seven. So the total size of this code is 28 bytes compared to the two bytes of the original instruction in the x86 ISA. Let me finish with this question and then we take our 15 minute break. Is that okay? We will finish very soon. Uh, so uh, part C says, assume the contents of the x86 register file are as follows before the execution of this instruction. And these are our registers, the content of these registers. And it says, now consider the MIPS assembly code that we have just written here. Uh, how many total instructions will be executed by your code to accomplish the same function as the single rep MOP SV uh, in x86 uh, accomplishes for the given uh, register state. So the given register state is this one here. And as you can see, this register ECX has this value. This is a hexadecimal representation, but if we convert it to decimal representation, is this number here. So, because this ECX re uh, register tell us the number of times that the loop, this loop here, is going to be repeated, the total number of bytes that we are coping, and the body of the loop has six instructions the total number of instructions executed in this case is six times the value of register ECX plus one because remember that in the beginning of the loop we, we had this BEQ uh, instruction. So this is our total number of instructions executed for uh, MIPS compared to one single instruction that will be executed if we uh, have an x86 ISA. The last part, part D, is exactly the same. So the question is exactly the same, but the contents of the register file in this case are different. And if you observe the value of ECX in this, uh, this time, it is zero. So if it's zero, we are not going to enter the loop. Right? If it's zero, this ECX is zero, this register one is zero, so we don't execute this loop, this loop body any uh, single time. So the total number of instructions that are executed in this case with these contents of the uh, register file is only one. It's only the first BEQ instruction that you have in the code. Is that clear? Okay. It's about data flow. Um, do you remember data flow? So it was kind of um, uh, early in the lecture. I think it was on the, I don't know exactly which week, but um, it has been a while probably you are not looking at data flow machines. Um, so this question um, asked for a Fibonacci function implementation, right? And it gives you some uh, nodes here that you can use, such as addition and um, greater than uh, operand, then copy and branch. So you are allowed to use only those, and also you can um, use constant inputs um, to feed to your nodes. And that's it. So using those nodes, you will need to implement Fibonacci. So just say, um, a quick reminder about Fibonacci. So it was, uh, it is a like series of numbers which goes like zero, uh, one, one, and then two. So basically each number is, uh, except for F zero and F one, uh, each number is the sum of the previous two numbers, right? So basically the next number is one plus two, and the next number is two plus three, and then eight, then 13, and it goes like this. So F0 is 0 and F1 is 1. So this is uh, by definition. And the rest is Fn, Fn minus 1 plus F minus 2. And so you can implement this in a recursive manner, but it is, I guess, more difficult in data flow. Um, 
So just uh, the iterative version is, I guess, easier, where you, you will just basically do it as I showed here. Um, start with zero and one, and then the next number is uh, the sum of uh, the previous two numbers. So here, um, in this type of questions, I, I guess uh, it makes more sense to start simple, like to start with part of the question, but not to like design everything, the entire data flow at once. So you should do it really step by step. So the first, first step should be in this question, um, making, the, making the data flow engine work for n equals zero, right? So for n equals zero, your data flow engine should return zero, right? Because this is how F0 is defined. Okay, so um, let's start with some input n. So I will write it here, okay. So we have n, so we'll assume that this is zero, right? But uh, it, it could be anything. So let's assume this is zero. And so the first thing we'll need to do is to compare this against zero, right? And basically, here we will try to make this work only for the case where n equals zero. But still, we will need to compare this, right? And then, if this is equal to zero, basically what we will do is, uh, so I don't want to connect this directly because we will do something else later. So I will do a copy here in advance because we will copy this n somewhere else. But um, okay, let's do it like this right now. Okay, so we compare. So we know that here the result will be false because uh, n will be equal to zero, but not larger than zero. And then, so this will generate some flag, right? So let's also copy this flag. And then um, the next thing we will do is, so if, if, if the result here is false, we will basically we'll need to uh, return zero, right? And then this is simple. So we'll just basically put here a branch node and then feed this in here. And if this is false, so this is the false path, right? Zero here, which is hard-coded, should be directed to the output, right? And if this is true, you should just consume this, but do nothing, right? So we just consume the zero. And then the rest of the logic will do something else. Okay, so um, basically, so here, just with this data flow, it is working fine for n equals to zero case, right? If it's zero, it returns zero. If it's not, if n is not zero, it is not doing anything uh, meaningful. Okay, so the next step is making it work for other values too, right? So for n equals one, it should return one. So we should do uh, something else to, um, to implement that case. So let me put t here to indicate the true pad. <laughs> Um, okay, um, so the next thing we will do is, so since we here check the, um, check the first iteration, we will need to decrement n if it's larger than zero, right? And then continue iterating. Okay, then um, we already have the copy node here. So we will um, copy this to a branch node. And then this branch node will be controlled with the same flag here that was generated previously for n, right? And then um, basically, if this is false, right, you should do nothing about, with, with this n which is forwarded here. Right? We should just consume it. Uh, but um, we shouldn't do anything because it's already zero, so the, uh, the function should be uh, terminated at this point. So the false path in this case is ground. And if it's true, on the other hand, um, we should subtract one from n and do the next iteration. So this is minus one. Um, and then basically, we will need to compare this n minus one again against zero, and then see whether it's now equal to zero. Um, so we already have a comparator node here, but um, 
So I will do another one. So I'm not sure if this is this will be possible to reuse this. If, even if it's possible to do that, it will be too confusing to understand. So I will just create a new one because this is hard coded to um, this output logic here, right? Which is receiving a zero. So I'll just um, duplicate this and um, and basically. So this will be n minus one right here, which is coming. So this is n minus one in this case. So let's copy this again. And then compare this against zero. And then this is basically the new flag, which will be used for all iterations except the first one. Right, so for the first iteration, we will use the, yes? Uh, can you quickly uh, recall how the, the branch node works? I don't get it. Yeah, sure. So, so branches, um, so it, get, it, it has two inputs, right? So two inputs should be val valid, and it outputs either from the false path or true path. Mm -hmm. right? And basically, so um, one of the inputs is the flag, And one of the inputs is data. So if flag is true, the data goes through the true path. If flag is false, data goes through the false path. So the token is generated only on one of the output paths in the branch node. Is it clear? Okay. Okay, so we do this. And then um, now we'll build our, um, like this addition operation here, which, uh, some, uh, which adds together the last two numbers in the sequence. Um, so for that, we'll need another control node here, another branch node, which will be again controlled by the same flag. So from now on, we'll always use the same flag, but um, okay, so we'll also have some other node here and for n equals one case, we'll just need to add together zero and one, right? So we know that. So for now, let's just hard code those values. So I will draw in zero like this. And um, we can also draw one like this. Mm. Is there anything we are missing? Okay, so I don't think so. So you can ignore this branch for now. We will connect this later. So let's just consider n equals uh, one case right now. And basically, this result should be forwarded to out if um, branch. So we have another branch here. This is data, and this is control. Let's get in. This is the true path. This is the false path. And this false path, sorry, it's kind of ugly, but this false path should be connected here to the out in this case. So basically here what happens is, in the first iteration, if this flag here, if this comparison results in false, the output will be produced from here, right? And then the rest of the data flow engine will, be, uh, will not be active because it won't have any tokens here. So I'll show you a quick example of how it works with some random n number. Um, but when in the first iteration, this comparison generates true, then we won't be using this output logic anymore, right? So the output will come from here. So for example, for n equals one case, this will generate false, sorry, this will generate true, Right, and then this value will just be consumed, and then this true will go here, and then this will cause n minus one to be generated. Right, when if if this was false, n minus one will not have been generated because it's grounded here. Okay, n minus one is generated, and then it's forwarded here, right? And this is basically the sum of uh, one and zero, which is forwarded to the out. Okay, so I think. Now we have it working for the two cases, zero and one, which were the uh, like hard-coded um, values for uh, Fibonacci um, 
sequence. And now we will just uh, make it like work with any arbitrary n. And for that, basically, we'll create a loop where the, this result um, is forwarded on the true path back to this uh, addition logic, right? And then this is basically, um, so this will need to be connected here. Um, but we will need to forward the same value to this branch logic two, because this will be the n, 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 n minus two, if you will, right? So because, so this data forwarded here is just the result of the previous iteration, n minus two, uh, n minus one, but we will also need n, mi n minus two, right? And then we will get it from here. Basically, um, we will forward this value here and then copy it. So I will put a copy here. Um, and then this copy is copying the value here and, and also here to this branch logic. And this branch node is, so this is the false path. And then this is the true path. It generates value for other iterations. So this hardcoded zero will apply only, only once in the first iteration. Okay, so this is kind of ugly, but uh, here we have copy node and then this gets one in the first iteration and otherwise gets a token from here, from this pad. Okay, so is there anything that we're missing? Uh, one thing we are missing is this, so we haven't connected this here, which is um, like continuously generates n minus one, n minus one for each iteration. So this should go here as, a, as the data input of this branch. Um, and I think we have all other paths handled. Okay, so um, let's test the case where n equals two. How much time do we have? Okay. Um, so I, 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 I hope I'll finish like in five minutes. Okay, um, so let's just uh, test the n equals to two case. I think we already verified n equals to zero and one. Uh, it should be obvious here. Okay, so for n equals two, so we start from here, right? So this is the only place where we have a token ready to execute, right? So this is n, which is two, we know this is two. And then, so this is being consumed by this copy node, right? So I'll just show it like this. So this is also forwarded here. So we have two on those two places. And then this node is also ready to fire because it has all its inputs, inputs ready. So we have here streams of zeros, and then here we have two. And then this node will consume this two and will generate true, right? Because two is greater than zero. And then this node is also ready to fire, and then uh, we will copy true here, and then we will also copy true here. Okay, so we have the flag here. T, we have data zero. So this node is also ready. So we'll consume T here and also this stream of zeros. And then since this is true, this will do nothing, right? Because it's connected to ground. So basically this thing will like terminate here and will not be used for the rest of the uh, iterations. Okay, and now what happens is, what else we have ready here? Um, This one? Yes, it shouldn't have three inputs. Um, so basically here what I tried to show is um, those two data inputs are connected to each other, right? So it's just shortcut. So basically a token either comes from this path, from this copy node, right? Or from this copy node. So in this case, for the first iteration, it comes from this copy node, right? So we have two as data here. We have true as a flag here. So we can also consume those two values over here. And then when this um, branch node fires, it will forward two here on this path, right? And then we have two and minus one. This is also ready to fire and this will calculate one. So we get one here. 
and then we copy one here, and then we copy one here. Right? So this time, we received data from this path, and this path is not producing anything anymore. Okay, and then we consume this one, this again generates true, and then we copy this true here, we copy true here. Right? So initially we had zero and one here for this addition, so we consume those two, this is one, the result is one, and then this branch node is ready, we consume those two, and from the true path we get one here. So this was copy node, and then copy node copies one here, and then copies one here, right? And then this branch is ready, so we consume the true and one, and forward one from the true path. So this addition in the next iteration, the current iteration gets one and one, right? So previously it was zero and one. So it's one and one, and then this is being consumed, we get two here. Okay, so actually we found our answer, but um, this is not directed to the output yet, right? Because we don't have the flag ready here yet. So we need to propagate the flag. So, um, yeah, I guess we forgot that pad. So here, um, this flag should also be connected here, right? So it's same as the data. So um, as data receives the token from like two different paths, so the, uh, the flag is doing, right? So here the flag was uh, true, so we get that true here, right? And then this, this true is being consumed, so basically one is forwarded here, and then uh, one minus one is zero, right? And then zero gets here, and then it gets copied here, and also gets copied here. So this time, this comparison node generates false instead of true, right? And then this false is copied here and also here. Uh, sorry, this is false, right? And then since this is false, this is grounded and it's not generating any more tokens here on this pad. Right? And then we have false here, and then this false is forwarded here, right? Which is again grounded, so this just consumes this with whatever data is here. And then we also copy this false here. And we had two as a data here, right? And this is the false pad. So we basically forward this two here to the output and we get two for a case where n is two. So this data flow may not be like very obvious at first, but basically you need to iterate yourself with different values and maybe try different implementations. But uh, the main thing that you need to get from here is that concept of producer and consumer, right? So a token can only fire, uh, I'm sorry, a node can only fire if all of its input tokens are ready, otherwise it cannot fire, yes? Here you mean? Yes. This part? Okay, we could. Yeah, so this is the flag part, right? Oh no, okay, yeah, okay. I guess you're right. So this basically should be connected here. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, I guess, other questions? Okay, then we can move to, oh, question? Yes. Yeah, I mean, so here in this notation, it's not clear, but um, so you can do that in a, in, in a data flow engine. You can define to have like constant stream of some value, right? So here, uh, I, I think I explained like that. So here we have streams of zeros. So I will show it like the zero dot dot dot. So it continuously gets zero tokens from this input, right? But those are just one time values that are being generated only once when you initialize your, uh, your data flow engine. So same here, this is also dot, dot, dot. And same here, minus one. Okay, so those are all streams, but those are initial values, this zero and this one. So this is also stream. I guess you need to make the notation more clear. Okay. Okay, 
I think uh, we will continue with other questions. Okay. So the second question is from homework four, the pipelining question. So here in this question, we have uh, six instructions given to us, and we need to calculate how many cycles do, do they take uh, for different configurations of the hardware. So uh, we have some information here that we are going to use in each uh, bullet points. So the first question asks, uh, how many cycles does it take if we have a non-pipeline machine? So <clears throat> here, uh, so first of all, if you don't see uh, very clear explanations in the exam, you can put your assumptions as it's stated in this note two, sorry, not somewhere. Yeah, note two. So as long as you made uh, assumptions that make sense and uh, you follow, you'll be consistent across the uh, question, then your solution should be fine. And here we made a, we make an assumption here in the first uh, question. So in this part, we see that uh, when we have a pipeline, fetch takes one cycle, decode takes one cycle, execute takes uh, six cycles for multiply and four cycles for addition. And then right back takes one cycle, right? So uh, what we, our basic assumption here is when we run a mole, then it's gonna take nine cycles. When we uh, run add, then it's gonna take seven cycles. So in total, it's gonna be 48 cycles when you just add them up on top of each other because we don't have pipelining here. In the second question, uh, we have some configuration for some pipelining. So we are using this scoreboarding technique uh, and in our hardware we have five adders and five multipliers and we do not have any data forwarding, right? Okay, so uh, one thing we need to be very careful about is the data dependencies here. So if you, if you look at these registers, as noted in this not one, each instruction is specified with the destination register first, then this line means you multiply R1 and R2 and you uh, write the result to R3, right? And in the second instruction, you need the value of the R3. So the second instruction have to wait, has to wait for the first instruction to complete and write back the results to the register file. So I can just actually mark this data dependency here. As you can see, uh, the mole gets into here, fetch, decode, and then it has six cycles of execution and then writes back. And when you have the second instruction, you fetch it, and then you need to wait until the result of R3 is written back to the register file to be able to successfully finish decode. So uh, we have this kind of dependency here. After write back, we decode and then continue, right? And then uh, you just follow the same uh, idea for the other instructions as well. So I just put like two rows here uh, because it doesn't fit, the whole thing doesn't fit into one line. So uh, this is until like 16 cycle, and I uh, repeated 15 and 16 cycle here. This is just copies of these. And then you can follow the uh, rest here. So another uh, dependency we see is uh, between this instructions R7 result, and this uses R7, right? So this has to wait for this, and it is the same thing. We write back and then decode here. And when we look at the multiply in the last uh, instruction, so it uses R5 and R6. And uh, these are calculated by these instructions, right? So these instructions complete in 15th and 16th cycles. So uh, we already have the data in the register file when we come to this decode stage then we, can, we don't have to stall and we can just finish executing the program in 28 cycles. Yes? Uh, why can't you decode the following instructions while it is uh, right, uh, executing the program? 
while executing one? Uh huh. So this D code goes to where in your question? Ninth? Third column here. But uh, you need to finish the execution to understand what is the value of R3. To be able to get the R3 and put it to the. Yeah, but in the decode, you read from the register file, right? So you fetch, meaning that you fetch the instruction from instruction cache, and then in the decode, you read the. So fetch the operand is in the decode stage. Yeah, so you need to fetch the operands from register file and decode stage, yes. Okay, so. In the third part of the question, we have one simple difference here, which is we have data forwarding now. And we still have five headers and five multipliers here, and we are using scoreboarding technique. Okay, so uh, what matters here is now we can get the result earlier than we were doing in the previous part, right? So the result of the first instruction is ready here at the end of eight cycle, right? And then we don't have to wait for it to be written into the register file and then we read it uh, from there, right? So in this case, we have a data forwarding. So I just assume that this data forwarding happens at, from the end of the multiplier or adder to the uh, decode stage which gives me this kind of uh, dependency here. So I can say one cycle here. So this decode was in 10th cycle, now it's in ninth cycle. And you continue and do the same thing, and then you see that at the end, you just save two cycles here. Uh, in the third part, now we have a little bit more change. So this is like the first case. We do not have data forwarding. But this time we have one adder and one multiplier instead of four, five of them. So uh, here actually another assumption comes. Uh, here we assume that uh, once we start using an adder uh, for an instruction, then uh, we cannot use, we cannot pipeline inside this adder. So we just give the uh, inputs to this adder and we get the output at the end of the fourth cycle, or uh, in multiply, multiplier case, it's at the end of the sixth cycle. So here, uh, what matters is, so uh, this part is, this R3 is exactly as in the uh, B, uh, B part of the question, uh, but when we have the second add here, then we cannot start executing here because at this cycle, the adder is being used by the second instruction. So we need to wait until it's completed and then we start using it from this side. And then once you just follow the same idea and uh, do the rest, then you see that now we uh, completed 31st cycle which means that uh, in the previous one it was 28. Now we have lost uh, three cycles because we don't have additional adders and multipliers. And uh, the last question is, if you do not have, do you have a question? Okay. So the last part, uh, the same story, we have scoreboarding, one adder, one multiplier with data forwarding. So what we do is basically we just copy paste the result in the D and we just uh, push the, uh, the cycles back uh, based on this data forwarding, which is the same thing we did in the uh, question part C. So this is like a bonus here, like three points, right? Because it's just some redundant thing. And if you co complete it, you, you will see that it's going to complete in 29th cycle. And that's all of the pipelining question. If you have questions, I can answer. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, I think, yeah. So I'm not sure if it's very realistic, but it can be okay. I'm not sure. Uh, could you email after the class and I can give you a more uh, determined answer? <laughs> yes. Which one? This one? Uh, this multiply unit? So uh, this is, okay, so there's another bottleneck here, right? So uh, you have to fetch and decode these instructions and you have, you, you have a bottleneck over there. So the, the fetch stage of the pipeline is busy with the second instruction still here. So you cannot fetch this. So to avoid it, for example, you can go for uh, fetching like multiple instructions at the same time and more complex time. Cycle 11 here. So you're asking why this, this stalls here? So after fetch, it needs to go to decode, and the decode is busy with this here. Any other? No? Okay. Then we can go for the next question, I guess. Okay, so we will continue with this question on... Um, Thomas Sulo, and I think uh, Professor Mutlo already like showed some example um, during the lectures, but um, I think uh, this is an important concept that uh, we can go over uh, once more. Um, okay. So I'll uh, just quickly um, read the question. So this is. Uh, kind of a um, question that uh, doesn't require too much computation or um, uh, like uh, too much knowledge exactly about how the algorithm is working, but it's asking more about the overhead and like how many functional units or uh, comparators you need in your design. So it basically uh, defines those properties where you have eight functional units and 32 registers and each register is uh, 64 bits wide. And now you have 16 reservation stations entries per functional unit. And so basically you have a reservation station for each functional unit, and you have eight of those, right? And each reservation station will have 16 entries. So this will um, basically look something like, um, let me see, oh, this is so ugly. Um, yeah, so basically it will look like this, right? So you have some functional units here. Um, Okay, I can't draw very well, but you have eight functional units in total, and each functional unit, each functional unit will have its own reservation station. Okay, and we have 16 entries in total per a reservation station. And uh, there are as many reservation stations as functional units, right? Okay, so uh, this is so far what uh, the question told us. And uh, also there are 32 registers, uh, 32 architectural registers. Um, and then again, importantly, um, each entry in the reservation station can hold up to two source registers. So basically, um, this is like, uh, so this is exactly the same reservation station that we saw, uh, that we had in the slides uh, during the lecture. Basically, um, here we have two source operands, right? And then it has um, separate tag fields for each source field. I guess you can see it. And then uh, separate data fields. Yes. So it looks something like this. And the question is asking um, about how many tag comparators are there per reservation station entry. Um, so if we go back here, so 
in a single reservation station entry, we have two, um, two tags, right? Because we have two source uh, operands. And um, so we will need um, a comparator for each tag uh, for each functional unit, right? Because at this, uh, in the same cycle, each of those eight functional units can produce a result. And this result needs to be compared with um, each of the tags in the, um, in the reservation station entry, right? So we have two tags here, and we have eight functional units. So basically, it means that we will need eight multiplied by two times tag comparators. Okay, is it clear? Yeah, so basically, the result coming out from this uh, function unit will be compared against this tag and this tag. So same for this functional unit, right? So it will need to be compared against those two tags. And the same is true for all uh, function units. Basically, we will need two comparators for each functional unit. Then the answer is um, 8 by 2, which is 16 tag comparators per uh, reservation station entry. Okay, is it clear? Um, and then the second question, B, is uh, what is the total number of tag comparators in the entire machine? So this is kind of um, like tricky because if you just think about reservation station entries, you may um, not take into account the uh, RAT register alias table, right? Because it, it should also have some um, comparators because when you uh, calculate the result, you don't need to only update the reservation station entries, but also the register alias table, um, which is not shown here. But uh, if I draw this, the register alias table will be basically, um, it's, it will have 32 entries because we have 32 architectural registers, right? And then it will have data field for each entry. Um, it will have some tag field, right? And it will also have, uh, have some uh, have valid bits. Um, okay, so basically, we also have some comparators here, right? So one comparator for each tag. And then it will be again multiplied by the number of functional units because um, in a single cycle, we will need to compare those tags against each of the results coming out from the functional units. Okay, so um, if we like um, accumulate everything together, so uh, we have 16 tag comparators for each entry, right? And we have, um, we have 16 entries in a single reservation station. And then we have eight reservation, uh, yeah, we have eight reservation stations in total. Okay, so those are the, uh, total number of tag comparators for the reservation stations. For the register alias table, we'll also need 32 multiplied by eight comparisons. So here eight, again, is the number of functional units we have. Yeah, and you can calculate this, okay? Um, what is the minimum possible size of the tag? So this depends on how many um, Entries you have in your um, in your ent uh, in your all reservation stations, right? So as we show here, so you may have um, in a single reservation station you may have 16 um, entries for which you can do some computation and uh, produce a result, right? So um, um, so you can uh, like remember this from the slides that we address those as a. B, C, and et cetera, right? So basically those are the addresses of those entries. And you need addresses as many as the total number of entries you have in your system. So there are 16 entries in a single reservation station. Um, and we have eight reservation stations in total, right? Which makes 128. So this is the number of address, uh, this is the address space that we should be able to address, right? And basically, this is equal to uh, two to the seventh, and this means we ha we need seven bits um, as a tag 
to be able to address or refer to all reservation station entries. So the minimum is seven. Of course, you can have more than seven, but then uh, you'll have some uh, redundancy, right? Some useless bits. I guess nobody has any questions. Okay. Um, and then what is the size of the register alias table in bits? Uh, so the register alias table is, um, it should look something similar to uh, this thing here that I draw, right? So we know the tag that should be at least seven bits. <coughs> and then the data is given in the question. So the architecture, uh, architectural registers are 64 bits wide. So then per entry, we will need 64 bits. And then we should have at least some valid bits, right? So for a single entry, we will have uh, 72 bits. And we have 32 uh, entries in total. So it will be um, 72 multiplied by 32. And I guess, uh, so just let me check if I'm missing anything. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, that's it. So this is the total like storage needed for the register alias table. And then the last part is, what's the total uh, size of the tax storage in the entire machine in bits? So it only asks about tax storage right now. So we should include the tax storage in the register alias table um, as well as in the reservation stations. So in the reservation stations, um, we have two tags per entry, right? So it is 14 bits, because we know the tag is seven bits. So it is then 14 multiplied by 16, because we have 16 entries per reservation station, and there are eight of them, right? So this is the tag storage for the reservation stations, plus uh, the tag storage for register um, alias table, which is 32 multiplied by um, seven, right? We have only seven bits uh, in each entry, okay. I guess is this correct? Is the total minimum size of tax storage in the entire machine in bits? Okay, yeah, okay. I think clear. I think that this was a uh, relatively simple question. Okay, the next question is on out of order execution. We solved a very similar question during the first discussion session, if you remember. Um, so this is basically testing your knowledge in um, Tomasulo's algorithm. And um, I will just highlight a few important things here in the question. Um, so there is a one cycle fetch and one cycle decode stage. And um, this machine can execute two different instructions, add and multiplication. And um, each of those take different numbers of cycles in the um, execution unit that they are executed. So those execution unit, the adder and the multiplier, are not pipelined. And the addition takes two cycles, and the multiplication takes three cycles. Um, let me see quickly if there was anything else that was important. Um, I guess not for now, but I will refer to um, to the text here in, in the question later. So the, uh, let me um, let me uh, move to the questions. But uh, before that, uh, so these are um, the state of the register alias table, RAT, and reservation stations at the point where all the instructions are fetched. And this program has four instructions. Um, which is also highlighted here. Okay, so, and, and th this is the state of those structures after uh, dispatching all of those four instructions. And dispatch happens during the decode stage. It's also written here in the question. Um, so the first part is to find out what are those instructions, including the destination register, the type of instruction, and the source operands here, the source registers. So I will fill this table here on this side, so we can like see everything in one place. 
Okay, so um, so the f first part is very simple, like figuring out uh, what are the instructions. You basically um, look at those tags over here in the reservation stations, and usually there's a dependency which helps you figure out like which instruction comes first and which uh, comes after. Um, so from the question, we know that um, the instructions are issued to the or the instructions are allocated to reservation station orders, uh, reservation stations um, in top to bottom order. Okay, so here when we look at a single reservation station, we know that this instruction comes before this instruction in the program order. Um, okay, so so we have to start by looking at the first entries here in the two reservation stations. So we can easily tell that this instruction over here, the multiplication, comes first before this instruction over here because this is dependent on the multiplication, right? So the D um, tag is here as a source operand to, to this addition instruction. Okay, so the first instruction is multiply, what is the destination register? So for that, we have to look at the register alias table, right? Um, we don't see any D, which means it is overwritten uh, by the next, one of the next instructions. So we have an instruction that comes after this multiplication that writes to the same destination register. So let's call this destination register X for now, since we don't know what, it, what that is. And the source registers are... Um, R1 and R1, which we can tell based on this information here, right? So the, date, the source operand is valid and it is five. And um, only R1 has its value set to five. So the two source operands are R1 and R1. So next instruction would either be this one over here, um, identified by tag E, or the instruction that has tag A. Um, so here, deciding which one comes first is again very easy because we have a dependency to A here. So A should come first, right? And the second instruction is add. It writes to R1 register. And its source operands are, one of them is, um, so it's dependent on this instruction. So this should be, the source register should be the same as the destination register of this instruction, right? So it should be X. And then the next source register is eight. Uh, the value of the register is eight, which corresponds to R2. Okay, and then the third instruction is either B or E. And since E is dependent on B, we can tell that the third instruction should be B, which is an addition which writes to destination register four, R4, and the source operands are A and A. A was writing to R1, so the source registers are R1 and R1. And the last instruction is multiply, writes to R3, and source registers are R1, and B was writing to R4. Okay, yeah, so those, uh, this is the program basically, and we couldn't find any clue, like what is X here, right? So it could be R1, since um, R1 is overwritten by this instruction over here, or it could be R4, or it could be R3. So it could be any of those instructions, and nothing changed, uh, based on like which register you put here. Um, so, so like let's say um, is R1, uh, like when we do the next um, next part of the question, but you can assume this to be any of those three registers, basically. Um, or maybe you can just leave it as X. Um, but basically, in the solution, you have to uh, make it clear that you understand that this could be any of those three registers, okay? So just, like, don't just leave it blank. Uh, put something like X and explain that it could be like one of those three or four registers. It could be one of the three, yeah. Okay, so this is the program. And um, yeah, we are done with part A now. And part B is basically simulating that program. 
uh, on the processor that was given, and we have to fill this chart over here. So let me quickly write these instructions here. Um, so it will be easy. This was R1. This is R1, R1, R2. Yeah, I should have written those here. R4, R1, R1, R2, R1, R4. Okay, and then we have to fill the rest of the table. So we know that this processor has a fetch stage of one cycle, it has decode. Uh, multiplication instructions are executing in three cycles. So we will have three execute stages in here. And then, um, and we have write back. Okay, so this is the first instruction. The second instruction we can fetch here, we can decode and dispatch here, but since it has dependency, it has to wait until the end of the write stage to execute. So it will start executing here and we'll do write back. So um, in the question, always like, uh, this information will always be provided. So uh, try to find um, this part to, to um, determine whether um, execution can start at the same cycle in which the destination register is written or it can start after it. So in this specific question, um, it cannot start, so I cannot put E here. I have to put E over here after, after the write back stage. And that information is, um, let me find it. Yeah, a dependent instruction can begin execution in the next cycle after the write back if it has all of its operands available, okay? So it's simple and then uh, for, for the next add, it is the same, so we can fetch and decode it here, but we have to wait for R1. So again, we have a dependency, so we can execute it here and write back. And then the last instruction, again, we fetch and decode it. And to execute it, we have dependency to R4, which is this instruction. We can execute it over here and write back. And I feel like I made a mistake. I think it was supposed to take 16 cycles. Can you see where I made the mistake? Anybody? No? Okay, maybe it was 15. Maybe I remember it wrong. Oh yeah, okay. Okay. It should be three executions and write back. Okay, that's it, and we are done with this part too. Let's take a look at the last part, unless you have any questions. Yep. Um, how, uh, I don't see how the third instruction could get into decode. No, wait. Uh, it leaves the decode stage and goes to the reservation station, so the decode stage is three again, right? Yes. Okay, then I understand. Yeah. So this is slightly different from um, in order execution, where usually we do the register fetch, fetching the source operands at the decode stage. So here, that's not happening at decode, right? So you are not accessing the, necessarily the register file at decode. You are just like allocating a reservation station entry and filling it accordingly with all the dependencies. Okay. And the last part is, um, updating those two structures um, based on how they would look at the end of the um, 12th cycle, basically here. So um, what happens at the end of 12, uh, cycle 12? This instruction completes, this instruction completes, and this instruction also completes. So in the reservation station entries, we should only have this fourth instruction, uh, right? Other entries should have been cleared. Let me see if I can put this side by side. Almost. Okay. 
I hope you can see it. Okay, at least you can see the first part. Okay, so we know that this was the first instruction, this is the second, this is the third, and this is the last instruction. So this is finished, so I'll just put dashes here at the end of cycle 12. Uh, B is also complete. D is complete, so we don't have to fill anything here. And for E, uh, since A is complete, it will have its data available here, the value will be set. B is also complete, so this will also be set. So let's find out what are these values. So the result of this operation is five by five, 25, right? And um, so D is 25 plus eight is 33. So whenever we see 33, we can put, uh, whenever we see A, we can put 33. And then, um, okay, so basically here we will have 33 and B will be 66. Okay, so I just executed those instructions quickly. Um, so this is 33 and this is 66. And the rest is also blank. Um, okay, and to fill the register alias table, it is again the same thing. Uh, we already ha calculated the values, so we know A was 25, so this will be updated to 25. Um, R2 is untouched. R3 is set by this instruction. It's not complete yet. So, sorry, this is E, this is zero, and we don't have the value. And then R4 is B, which is 66. Okay, that's it, basically. And this was the last part. Okay, just, like when solving this question, just be careful to read that part carefully, or like you don't have to read it at once, but be careful when you need like to like make sure like what kind of information is provided. For example, when you realize this part, like whether you can put E here or you have to delay it one cycle, you have to like go back to the question here and look uh, at what's provided. Okay, any other questions? Then we will continue with the next one. Oh, there's a question. Can it be 33 and R1? Sorry? Can it be 33 and R1 since A was A and 35? Yes, yes, you are right. Okay, yeah. This is A. I updated it by D. Um, so, like, I can answer this question, like, based on last year's, like, exam. Uh, there were students that, like, were able to solve all the questions. Um, so, when we design questions, we try to um, make them solvable in, like, approximately half of the time we are providing to you. So, yeah, so we, we can usually solve those questions in, in one and an hour if you are providing you three hours. Okay, and here, why we are still at 60% of the questions is because we are also explaining them to you. So if I was solving this question by myself, I wouldn't have been talking, right, and then spending time of like, uh, basically um, putting things in a way that you can see and understand better. So those things also add up. And also answering your questions take time. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think you can check um, the links that we have in the website for the past courses. And then from those past courses, you can check links for like even uh, older uh, courses. And then you will find like a bunch of uh, exam questions, a bunch of homework questions. Um, and you can also take a look at the architecture course, um, not only the digital design one. So some questions are similar, basically. 
Okay, then let's continue with the next one. And we will continue with the next question, which is on out of order execution. Um, so hopefully you remember the concept, so I will go quickly over this. Um, so here's some definition of what kind of instructions we are dealing with in this question. So we have two types of questions. One is add, which has this uh, number of cycles here and those stages defined. And okay. Okay, yeah, as I said, so the add instruction has those stages here. I think in total it's nine cycles. Yes, it says it here. And then for uh, multiply instructions, we have 11 cycles in total. So two more cycles in the execution stage. And um, the question is um, also um, describing it well, like uh, what is the um, uh, policy for, uh, for reading back the data? So it is basically when you have dependence, uh, data dependence between two instructions, the instructions that, has, um, that depends on the result on the previous instruction has to wait for the data to be written in the write back stage. And in the next uh, cycle, it can start executing. So the question has multiple parts. One of them is uh, figuring out an instruction sequence uh, that's composed of five instructions based on the information given in this table. So this part is how the, um, how the um, values in the register file looks like before the execution of five instructions. And this is what happens after executing those five instructions. Yes? Uh, in the previous question, we said that um, if there is a data dependency, uh, we can only start the decode after the write back finish. And now we are assuming that we can start executing after the write back finish. Right. Um, so, so that's because of the difference between in order execution and out of order execution, specifically with the uh, Tomasulos algorithm. So here it is different a little bit. Uh, so you will see as we like solve the question. But basically, here the decoding operation consists of um, allocating an entry and filling the entry in the um, in the uh, in, in the um, not register alias table. So you also update the register alias table, but um, you also update the reservation stations, right? Um, so I can show you like how it looks here. So probably this will remind you from the slides you saw in the, uh, in the, in the class. Okay, so basically the decode operation here is allocating that entry, but when we talk about like in order processors, then decoding mostly means reading the values from the register file. And obviously you cannot read the values before writing the new values into there, right? Okay. So here, how you can figure out what the instructions are just by looking at those two tables here, uh, like before and after version of, of the same table, um, actually. So uh, there's a hint in this question, which is the fourth instruction is given to us partially. We only uh, don't know the destination register, but we know that it is the multiplication of R6 and R6, right? And when we look at before and after version of the uh, register file, we can see that R6 is not modified, right? It, it remains as 10. So uh, we know that the result of this multiplication will be 100, right? But we don't see 100 anywhere in the register file, right? So someone, some other instruction has overwritten this 100, right? And there is only one possibility because we have only one instruction coming after this multiplication instruction here. So we don't know exactly what is the destination register, but just by considering this information, we can tell that the destination registers of those two instructions are the same. Okay, so let's start uh, one by one. So um, if you look at like, those given values and, and, and the final values we get, um, so basically your approach here should be trying to reconstruct the final values using the, uh, uh, using the values that we have initially. Um, so for example, um, we can see that R7 is updated, right? So it is 21 here, it was 11 here. So um, we can basically look for um, values here 
in this uh, like initial uh, version of the register file to to calculate this value of 21. So here the only option for doing that is adding together 10 and 11, right? So we cannot multiply 11 and 1 because we don't have 1 in the, um, in the uh, register file. So one instruction then should be um, an add which writes to R7 and uses R6 and R7 as source registers. Okay, so this is basically creating 21 in here. So let's look at some other values that has changed. So here we see 31 in register three, and the original value was seven, right? So now, given that we have 21 here in R7, we can calculate 31 by doing an addition, uh, another add instruction, right? So we will be updating our tree, and we will update it by um, so it will be again R6 and R7, okay? So we did that too. Um, other values that are updated is R0 and R2. So for R0, what we can do is, uh, so we already calculated 31 here and we have 10 and we have the multiplication instruction. So we can multiply those two registers and write the result to R0. So it will be a bit ugly, but this is the next instruction here. Um, actually, so initially when I was like solving this question, um, I, I, I was just writing down those instructions, but I, I decided to figure out their order later based on some other information. Okay, so here what I am doing is only just writing down instructions that I can figure out by looking at this table. But um, it happens that all those instructions have dependency between them, so it's very easy to figure out the order. Okay, but if it's a bit more complicated, which I doubt that it will be in the exam questions, then you will need to look at um, uh, some other information that will be given to you in the question, like um, the entire five instruction sequence completes an X cycles. Okay, so then you may end up with different orderings between those instructions, and different orders will result in different execution times, right? And then you can find the correct ordering by looking at the uh, number of cycles. But anyway, so if we continue here, we said that we can get um, 310 to R0, by multiplying R3 and, and, sorry, this is multiply, R3 and R6. Okay, and then we know that we have something here, so this will be the fourth instruction. And finally, we will need to calculate, um, so we also updated this, we will need instruction to, cal to calculate 410. And it is basically the addition of 310 plus 100, right? So this is already giving us 100. And we know that we need to write the result here to R2. So this instruction here should be modifying R2, right? So let's write it here again, and then I will fill this. So it will be updating R2, and it will do so with adding to R0, it will add 100. So this instruction here, here will give us 100, right? And in the beginning we said that it should be the same as this instruction that is uh, following it. So that instruction, the last instruction should also be um, R, R0 plus R2, right? So if you fill this here to have everything in um, written in a nice way, so the this was the first instruction, this is second, this is third, this is fourth, and this is the last instruction, okay? So this is add to R7, R6, R7, then another add to R3, and again R6 and R7, and the last is here multiplication, R0, R3, and R6, okay? Is it clear, did I miss anything? 
Okay, so that was easy. So in the next part, um, actually I, will, I also B and C together because um, they are sort of related. So basically in parts B and C, we have to execute uh, Tomasol's algorithm uh, with this instruction sequence that we find in part A. Okay, so basically it will be filling the register alias table, um, which is this here, the register file, and, and also the reservation stations. So let me do it like this. Okay, you can see it. It's better. Okay, you can see almost everything. Um, okay, so one thing I forgot to say, it is asking uh, specifically about the state at the end of cycle eight. So actually first it will be better to figure out um, what has happened inside the processor until cycle eight or at the end of cycle eight. Uh, so, so here in the beginning we were given with these um, stages that uh, the addition and the multiplication is going through. So I will just um, write it here. So in the first cycle for the add instruction, we will do fetch and then decode, and then we'll go through E1, E2, E3, E4, E5, E6, and then um, it will be right back, right? So this is the first cycle, second, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Okay, so cycle eight is where we are in the last stage of execution for the first instruction. Okay, so then at the end of cycle eight, we have no updates in the register table, right? Uh, in, in terms of final values here because we didn't perform any write back yet for any of the instructions. But what happens is until then, if I like write it quickly, we have enough time until cycle eight to fetch and decode all the instructions here. So we can fetch and decode the second instruction, we can fetch and decode the third, the fourth, and the last instruction, right? And we are still at cycle seven here, or so this was six, right? Seven and eight. Um, so somewhere here at, at, at the end of cycle six, we have all the instructions decoded, right? So we fill them to the reservation stations. Um, so I'll sort of do it quickly, but um, if you basically follow, um, follow, the, um, uh, follow the scheme here, um, you can fill um, the reservation stations and register alias table one by one. So for, for the add instruction, so we know that at the end of um, cycle eight, we will just have the information recorded in the register alias table and the reservation station and nothing else, right? So let's, write, uh, let's fill this part first. Um, so here we had the valid tag and value fields, right? Do you remember what those means? So tag is basically when you don't have the result, re result calculated but um, the result will come from another reservation station entry. And the tag is basically the ID of that reservation station entry, ABC for the addition unit and XYZ for the multiplication unit. Okay, so for the first instruction, uh, we have the up-to-date versions of R6 and R7 um, in the register uh, in, in, in the register file, right? So for those two source operands, the valid bit is one. We don't have any tag because we are not waiting for the result to come from another reservation station entry. And we have the values we can just look up from the, from the register file, 10 and 11. So 10 for R6, 11 for um, R7. Okay, and then the next instruction is add to R3. So it uses R6 and R7, but R7 is updated in the previous instruction, right? So this time we cannot read R7 from the register file. So although the first source operand here will be again one dash and 10, so no tag and it is valid, 
for the second operand, we will have zero as a um, valid bed, and then we'll expect the result from A, reservation station entry A, and we don't have the value, okay? So when this instruction um, in A completes, it will update this field over here. Okay, and the next instruction is multiply. So for multiply, we don't have R3, we are expecting it from here, we don't have R6. Sorry, we have R6 in, um, in the register file. So it will be zero and we will get R3 from B. We don't have the value and for R6 we have the value which is 10. Okay, is it clear so far? So you basically continue um, in the same way. For the second multiply, um, we have the R6 value in the register file, so we'll just have um, the valid bit set and the value here. And for the last instruction, we'll get the first source operand from here, which we put into reservation station enter X, and R2 will come from reservation station entry Y. Okay, so this will be X, this will be Y, both are not valid yet, and then we don't have the value. Okay, so we kind of did it, did it decoupled, but at the same time, when you are filling those reservation station entries, you can also update the um, register Alice table, but it was difficult for me to fit um, both pieces of paper at the same place. Um, if I do it, can you? Nice, okay. So this is easier to fill. So basically for R7, we are updating R7 here, right? Um, we will have valid set to zero, and um, the result will come from A, right? Because this is where we put the, uh, which, uh, the, the, this is the reservation sta uh, station entry we allocated for the first instruction, and we don't have the value. or or. or uh, you can preserve the existing value, right? So you, we can just write here um, 11, but it is really uh, a don't care value because we know that it is not valid because of the zero here. Okay, so, so in, it is both fine to write nothing here or just to keep 11, the uh, previous value. Okay, and then the next register we update is R3. So for R3, again, we will have zero because none of the operations are committed until end of cycle eight. And um, it is allocated to B, okay? And then R0 is again not valid, and then it's allocated to reservation station entry X. R2 is allocated to Y. And R2 is again allocated to C. So here you basically update this again, okay? So we don't have Y in the register alias table, but we have Y in the reservation station entry over here, right? So when, um, when this instruction over here, Y completes, it will not update the register file, okay? Because the most up-to-date version is supposed to come from C from the next instruction, but it will update the corresponding um, reservation station entry over here, okay? So if you, if you do everything sequentially, you will see that um, every instruction is getting the correct value, and at the end, you have the final values in the register file. Okay, and, and, and the rest of this uh, register alias table is basically the same as, um, the, same as the before here. Yeah. Uh, would in this case then make sense to fill the uh, register alias table uh, from the bottom up based on the uh, based on the resolution stations because then we could never run into an issue where we write um, something in the register alias table and suddenly figure out oh there's a new one would it make sense to write it from the bottom up? Yeah you can do that but so how Professor Mutlu was like doing this in, in his slides was uh, also whenever you first allocate a 
uh, reservation station entry, you also update the register alias table. So it is totally fine to do what I did here, to initially put a tag there, and then when the next instruction comes and overrides that destination register, you update it as well. So it is actually what happens inside the processor, right? Because you do one operation at each cycle. Okay, cool. I assume no more questions. So the question is about the Boolean logic and also through tables as it also writes here. So in this question we have uh, four inputs and also two functions which are directly related to these four inputs and we are basically asked to fill this table and also uh, write the Boolean formula for X and Y here. So these are our, these are our inputs A3 to A0 and these are our functions that we're going to fill the through table here. So let's look at the first, you can see it, right? Okay. So let's look at the first question here. The first question, it says, describes X first, and what X is basically, X is one when the input, uh, basically the all of the inputs, does not contain three consecutive ones in words A3 to A0. Or otherwise, in other words, it is zero when it contains three consecutive ones, basically. So let's, let's find such occurrences in, in this truth table. So for example, it contains three ones uh, consecutively, right? So then this means that here x should be zero. And we also have three consecutive ones here. So here also x should be zero, all right? And the last one should be, yeah, the last one is here. So this is zero. For, but for the rest of these, x will be one. Why basically, for the rest of them, I won't have any three consecutive ones. Uh, and let's just very quickly write this. All right. Okay, so, and the question says, uh, we fill the table and fill the true table and use uh, product, product of sums this is product of sums, form to write the corresponding Boolean equation for x. So basically, let me write it. So what a product of sums is, is we have, so we have, we have terms, and those terms are, I'm sorry, ah, oh, sorry. So for x, we have such terms, and those terms will be ended to each other. This is basically the uh, product of sums. And here, I will have the ors here. So what product of sums says us, basically, this x will be 1 if all of these terms are 1, right? Or in other words, this x will be 0 if one of these terms uh, is 0, basically. So I'm gonna pick the second option here because it is it will be easier for me to write the Boolean equation. Why? Because I have fewer zeros and I'm gonna write my equation accordingly based on that. So basically I'm gonna try to make x zero uh, if if those terms, if one of those terms becomes zero, basically. I'm sorry? All right, so I didn't write yeah, anything yet. So let's, so let's first thing, um, think the case when A3, A2, A1, and A0 is 1, 1, 1, and I will have 0 for x, right? So in order to have this, I need to have a term such as A3 not, A2 not, A1 not, and A0 not, right? And if all, uh, I'm sorry, and I have or here as well. So if I have ones for all of these, then this will be 0. Another term will be for this. So what, what, it, what it is is basically A3, A2, A1, and A0 is 1110. So how can I write it in a term? Is basically A3 not, A2 not, again, or A1 not, and A0. 
So if you put one, 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 zero here, then this will become zero. And the last one is basically that one. So I'm gonna directly write it, hopefully you understood the logic here. So it will be A3, A2 naught, A1 naught, and A0 naught, okay? And those are ended, and this is X, and this X will be zero if one of these terms are zero, basically. So this is the solution for, for A. For B, it asks for the sum of products, and Y is basically is one when no two adjacent bits in the world are the same. Basically, what it means is that, uh, basically, I won't have any adjacent uh, uh, input bits equal to each other, right? So this means that here, uh, where is that? Yeah. Here, I don't have any adjacent input uh, equal to each other, so this should be one. And uh, I guess here, yeah. Here, I also don't have any adjacent input equal to each other, then this should be one, and then rest should be zero, because for the rest of the cases, I will have at least one, two adjacent word inputs equal to each other, so rest is zero. And so what is uh, sum of uh, products is basically I have terms, those terms are ended, uh, inside ended and outside, those are ORed. Right. So again, like in another, in other words, so Y is one if one of these one, basically. So let's then write it in that way. So to make Y one, I have two options, either that or that, right? So this means that y is or a3, a2 naught, a1, and a0 naught. So this is similar to each other, but instead I or the terms here. And I said that if one of these is one, then y should be one. This is what the question is asking for, basically. So, I think there is no question related to that. So for C, I'll write. So for C, it says, please, uh, yeah, please represent the circuit of Y using only two input XORs and AND gates. So this is this will be. I'll write the circuit in a very intuitive way, and also I'll show you the equation later. But very intuitively, how you should be thinking is basically. For Y, so I don't, I shouldn't have any two adjacent uh, inputs equal to each other, right? So this means that those are basically XORs, right? So those shouldn't be equal to each other. So then how can I write it in that manner is basically, so this ensures that those two inputs won't be or it will give one when those are not equal to each other, let's say. For this one, this says that A2 and A1, uh, when A2 and A1 uh, is not equal to each other, then the, the XOR will give us the one again. So this is XOR. And for A0, probably you see where I am going. And here, similarly, this XOR gives one when these are not equal to each other. So basically, I'm gonna end those, right? And this is our very intuitive circuit. So if you need to prove that this is actually correct, I have something written here. So what you need to do is, let me see if you can see it, yeah. Yeah, what you need to do is basically, you need to write Y in, 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 a, in a Boolean equation and also take the De Morgan, right? And 
So when you take the demorgan, you will have something like this. So you can distribute those in such a way that those, all of these will be cleared. And the rest will give you some bunch of XNORs and XORs. And some of the XORs or XNORs will be implicitly included in other XORs. And then you will also end up with the same circuit. All right, if you don't have any questions related to that, we can take a break. Yeah. I'm sorry? Uh, no, the question asked for you the circuit, right? So if you show the circuit, but like be careful, like what the, make sure that you do what the question is asking for. For example, if the question says that use the Boolean algebra and not, for example, KMAP, don't use KMAP, but use Boolean, such as like those are the details. But if the question is asking for the circuit, it's enough for you to show the circuit. Okay, okay. Uh, let's solve this pipelining question. So, um, consider two pipelines machines implementing MIPS ISA, machine one and machine two, right? Uh, we have uh, both mati machines have the f uh, five pipeline, pipeline stages, very similar to the five basic pipeline <laughs> stages that we saw in, in class, and one uh, AL, AL, ALU. So, the first machine is... Uh, uh, machine uh, one does not implement inter interlocking, so it, it, ha it, it cannot detect dependencies on hardware. It assumes all instructions are independent and relies on the compiler to order the instructions such that there is sufficient dis distance between dependent instructions. So it's the compiler who has to deal with the dependencies. Uh, the compiler either moves other independent instructions between two dependent instructions, if it can find such instructions, or otherwise uh, insert knobs. Assume internal register file forwarding. So an instruction writes into a, uh, into a register in the first half of a cycle, and another instruction can correctly access the updated value of the same register in the next half of, of, of the cycle. So this is important, internal register file forwarding in this machine. Uh, and we assume that uh, the processor predicts all branches as always taken. Okay, the machine two uh, implements data forwarding in hardware. On, uh, on detection of flow dependency, uh, it can forward an operand from the memory stage or from the write-back stage to the execute stage. The load instruction can only forward from the write-back stage, so uh, the load instruction only from the write-back because data becomes available in the memory stage, but not in the execute stage like, like, other, like for other instructions. So assume internal register file forwarding, um, the same that in the previous uh, uh, machine. So uh, the compiler does not uh, reorder instructions in this case, uh, and assume that the processor predicts all branches as always taken. Okay, we have the, this piece of code. We have this piece of code, um, uh, load and store and add immediate, immediate and, uh, and a branch. Um, and these are the initial values. So basically, uh, we have dependencies here. These two instructions are dependent. We load in register 2 and we store register 2 into memory. And these uh, two instructions are also dependent. So the, we add in this, uh, we store the result of the add in this register one, and we compare register one with register 25. So we have uh, register 25 here, the content is uh, 25, so we execute this loop basically 25 times. Because we, we yeah, yeah, the initial uh, value of register uh, one is zero, so we increment each time, uh, in each loop we increment this register. So when the video code is executed on machine one, the compiler has to reorder the instructions and insert knobs if needed by the resulting code uh, that has minimal modification from the original. So for doing that, I'm going to uh, uh, to draw the, the pipeline stages. I think that this is easier to solve in this way. So if we have uh, this load, so we have the fetch, uh, decode, execute, memory and write back, right? So um, to execute uh, the, the store, 
uh, we need to um, we need to have the, this register content. Uh, so and, and we see here that we have some internal register file forwarding. So we can so in the same cycle that we write back in the in the load, we can read from the store. So at this point in the write back, we can read from the store. And we read registers in the decode stage. So we can do this. So this is the store instruction. This is the load instruction. This is the store instruction. So the best we can do is have the store here. Uh, so this is uh, decode. This should be fetch. Uh, execute. I'm right back. So we have some bubbles here. We have two bubbles here. So let's see if we can fill this, right? We have, you can fetch here, and we can fetch here two more instructions, right? So let's see if we can reorder the next instruction. So we see that these two instructions are independent of the previous one. So we can insert this uh, addition before. So we can put this add here, right? So we can put the... Uh, this add here, and then uh, we cannot uh, put, so the, the branch is dependent on the add, the same, so uh, to read the, the content of register uh, one, you have to wait for the, this write back, right? So we will need to, uh, uh, to execute uh, the decode in the right back, uh, let me check. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so basically, here we have to insert an op. So this will be execute. Um, decode, execute. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, execute, modify, write back. And the last instruction, uh, branch, uh, can fetch. Uh, so this is not very well aligned, but this is the decode phase, so we can. So when we grab that here, we can read re the register from here. So we can execute uh, memory and write, um, write back. So this bas is basically the code that uh, the final code that uh, we need to that the compiler needs to generate to execute this code correctly in machine one. Uh, any questions here? Okay. So, next question. Um, what's not specified here, it's not specified that it is or that it is not, it's the branch resolution that you see. Um, are branches evaluated in the decode or not? It doesn't specify here. So, Yeah, of course, you, if you can make an assumption. In this case, I'm assuming that uh, yeah, you can resolve the branch. Uh, uh, so here, all the processor predicts all branches are always taken, right? This is a very easy uh, branch predictor, so you can always assume that it's always taken, so you don't have any extra latency here. You, you can, yeah. More questions? So next question is, uh, when the given code is, uh, so I will answer, you cannot see this, right? Okay. So I will let this question to, to the end, and I will go to, to the question C, because I think that is, is easier in this uh, way. So um, calculate the machine code size for, uh, uh, the machine code size of the code segments executed on machine one and machine two. So in machine, in machine one, we have uh, basically five instructions. 
we have five instructions, and each instruction is 32 bits, so or four bytes. So we have 20 bytes. And in machine two, uh, we have uh, exactly the same code, so the compiler doesn't insert anything. So we solve the dependencies of hardware. So we have four instructions. So we have four by four bytes. That is 16 bytes. So uh, point uh, D. Uh, so question. Yeah. No, the, the, a loop, this, is a, this, a, this loop is executed dynamically, right? But you only need four instructions. Okay, so the... Four static instructions. Okay, the machine code would split it up in a linear, just going through it, but it would also... Um... Yeah, you iterate, you, you make a look o over these four instructions, right? Yeah. In that case, if you have uh, a loop of uh, an infinite loop, you will have infinite source code, that, that is, it doesn't make sense, right? Yeah. Um, so calculate the number of cycles uh, it takes to execute uh, the code segment on machine one and machine two. So for machine one, you already have this, this, uh, this diagram here, right? This is cycle one, cycle two, cycle three, four, five, six, six, seven, eight, nine. So this, is, so this is one iteration of the loop. So in one iteration of the loop, you see that you can issue uh, five instructions, five instructions. So, and the next loop can, uh, can start immediately after these uh, five instructions. So as we have uh, 25, loops, and we can start five instructions per loop, so we have 125 cycles. But in the last iteration, we have to finish, so imagine this is the last instruction, so we have to execute these uh, final pipeline stages that are for additional cycles, plus four cycles. This, yeah, 129. Uh, yeah. Uh, wouldn't it be 25 times uh, 4? Oh, no, okay, we have 10 no more. Never mind. Okay. Yeah, this is... Uh... So, calculate the number of cycles for machine 2. So, let's go to machine 2. So, in machine 2, we have... I will do it. Uh... Yes. So this is these are these are in actually these are instructions, right? This is the number of instructions. I I don't think so. So it's only the the number of cycles of this loop, right? Yeah, you just in that case you just will uh, you mispredict, right? But but your your loop will be executed already. So. You don't care uh, after that. Yeah. So for machine two, um, let's so. Okay. For machine two, we have this code. So we have first the load. 
that is uh, fetch the code execute memory right back then we have the store so on the store we see the definition of of, of the machine tool that uh, uh, the load the load instruction can only be forwarded from the right back stage because the data becomes available in the memory stage so the data becomes uh, available here so from here we can uh, forward this data to the execution stage so it's specified here right the forward from the memory or right the stage to the execute stage. So this, this data will, can be forwarded from the right stage to the execution stage di directly, right? So we have, uh, uh, we have this here. Um, uh, yeah, we have to go. So we have basically we have to stall uh, here we are not ready to to execute in this cycle uh, because we need to wait for for the data here so uh, next instruction is um, addition um, uh, basically we fetch the addition we have to wait because the code stage is occupied and then decode. Uh, well, here I missed the the other stages. Decode, execute, memory right back, and then um, the last instruction is uh, the branch. So the branch can only be fetched uh, in this stage because uh, this is occupied by the previous instruction. So here, so we here we have a dependency. Um, in these dependencies, uh, so we can forward from the from the memory stage in this case because this is not a load instruction. So here we can uh, in, we can forward data from here to the execution stage, right? So we don't need to wait in this case. So the question is asking. For the number of cycles, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine cycles. Uh, uh, so we have so we have in each loop uh, we need uh, five cycles. Uh, and then in the final loop, we need four additional cycles to finish the, the last instruction. So basically, it's the same, the same uh, number of cycles than the machine, machine one and machine two uh, executing the same number of cycles, 129. So here doesn't mention it doesn't mention anything about the uh, how this is implemented, right? So uh, you have to take the information that you have in this in in, in the question. So what the question says is exactly what we did here, right? 
So how it is imp implemented in the in in hardware is another question. But, but to me that would be relevant. I mean, I would just make an assumption, right? I'm assuming that it would be done in this in this way. Because for me, if you have um, dependency checking based on forwarding, um, right back to execute forwarding doesn't make sense. I mean, I would probably ask the app or the break because of this. Okay, but okay, we can discuss later. Um, but yeah, basically, but here the, the exercise is pretty clear in, in that sense, right? Yeah, it doesn't talk about how this is implemented in the, in the hardware, but so you assume internal register file forwarding, so an instruction writes into a register in the first half, and it can, other instructions can read in the second half. This is the for register forwarding, and for the other forwarding, uh, uh, it can forward an operand from the memory stage or from the write back stage to execute the stage. So the load instruction can only be forwarded from the write back because the memory, uh, the, the value is ready in the memory stage, so in the next stage you can forward to the execution stage. Uh, yeah, so the underneath details are not specified, but we can we have to assume that we can do this, what is specified in the question, basically. So, and the last, last question is, so I led this to the end because once we solve all these questions, it's very easy to solve. So when the given code sentence is, uh, is uh, on machine two, dependencies between instructions are resolved in hardware. Explain when data is forwarded uh, and which instructions are stalled and when they are stalled. So we already see that we install uh, uh, here, and we have data forwarding in here and, and here. Okay. Questions?